Okay. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am thrilled uh, to welcome you all um, to Illinois Environmental Council's Energy and Transportation Town Hall. Um, I would just like to say, um, my name is Samira Hnesian. I'm uh, the Energy Policy Director with IEC and uh, thrilled to join our Federal Policy Director, Brian Gill, and welcome you all on the line. Um, just really quick about IUC. Um, since 1975, um, the Illinois Environmental Council, or IEC, has worked to safeguard Illinois, its people, its plants and animals, and the natural systems on which all life depends on, depends by building power for people and the environment. Um, I, everyone on the line is muted by default. Um, just in terms of run of show, we're going to run through uh, a series of presentations, um, both on some uh, energy policies that are coming up in the next year, as well as some transportation policies that are coming up in the next year. Uh, so we have a, a really great slate of presenters um, for you uh, coming up. Um, Brian, if you don't mind adv advancing the slides a couple. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the run of show for today, um, we are uh, welcomed, uh, we're very happy to welcome Andrew Rain with Prairie Rivers Network to speak to the Ameren Rate Relief Bill and uh, DCARB. Uh, we will then move on to Equip Surcharge with APESCAR with PERG. Um, those are on the energy side. And then moving on to transit, uh, we will have Jose Ocasta Cordova um, from Little Village Environmental um, Justice Organization speak to clean trucks and uh, net Z. Then we will have Larissa Kohler and Eileen Nolan um, from the Environmental Defense Fund speak to health and equity insights. And finally, um, Audrey Wenick with the Metropolitan Planning Council will speak to safe streets. Um, so after we uh, conclude all presentations, we'll open up the line for Q and A. Um, we would love to hear from all of you and. Uh, provide an opportunity to um, have your questions and uh, answered. So with that, um, we can start with Andrew. OK, uh, let me just get my screen share going. OK, do you see my slides? We do. All right. Okay, uh, Andrew Rain with Prairie Rivers Network. Um, I am one of the facilitators of our uh, DCARB uh, subcommittee in the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. And uh, one of the things that came across our plate this, uh, I guess, last few months is the Ameren uh, Rate Relief Bill. Um, so this is HB 5799 and SB 4226, uh, formerly called the Power Price Mitigation Rebate Act. But just like everything, we rename it to something else immediately. So we've been calling it Ameren Rate Relief. Uh, introduced by uh, Representative Hoffman and Senator Belt. Um, so what is the Ameren Rate Relief Bill? Um, so first, the reasoning, uh, ratepayers in central and southern Illinois, including myself, are seeing um, substantial increases in their power bills. Um, in many cases, it's over 100% increase. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the rise in natural gas prices and other energy prices due to the war in Ukraine. Uh, impacts from COVID, and um, in part, uh, Ameren for a long time has not been investing in energy efficiency. So uh, increases in energy rate prices have a higher impact when and when Ameren isn't um, spending on energy efficiency programs that would that would be mitigating all of our electricity bills. Um, that's not to say that ratepayers in northern Illinois aren't also uh, having rate hikes uh, for various reasons. The, the war in Ukraine is definitely relevant, um, and they're also uh, have uh, utilities aggressively spending on um, uh, infrastructure that, that then ends up back on the, the charge. So um, we're seeing rate increases across the state. 
Um, but uh, Senators, uh, Senator Belton and Representative Hoffman introduced a bill to, uh, to address that in Ameren territory. Um, so what they're proposing to do is to take uh, $200 million um, from uh, DCEO, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Funds, um, and they would use that to refund ratepayers. Uh, it's an estimated uh, 170 to Ameren residential and small commercial energy customers. So um, who is that? Well, first, just to, to clarify Ameren, for those who don't know, Ameren is the um, grid operator uh, for basically much of southern Illinois, whereas ComEd serves um, the northern part of Illinois. Uh, and, and I'll also note that within these territories, there are also co-ops that actually aren't inside Ameren or inside ComEd, um, but, but this is sort of the the broad geographic swath of, of their uh, territory. So um, they've defined small commercial customers as non-residential retail customers that consume 15,000 kilowatt hours or less of electricity per year. Um, and it also, uh, yeah, right, it, it can include um, uh, small businesses as well. Um, so that's who's on deck to get this relief. Uh, the the proposed it would they would begin at the start of monthly billing period and continue through December 2020 billing period. So for those of you keeping track, December 2020 starts in about two weeks, and um, so we're looking at sort of the end of when this bill would provide relief. However, um, they also sort of baked in this clause that that would let them kind of look back five months. So um, we could have up to five months of um, the value of this rate relief applied to December bills and not listed here is some text from the bill that would uh, clarify that if, if it is bigger than your bill it can be applied forward so um, if you know five months of this rate relief is more than your December bill it gets applied to January to February until it's fully consumed um, so that's the, the the big picture of what the the proposal is um, there's a number of concerns that, that are worth highlighting uh, about the, the legislation. Um, not necessarily reasons to uh, oppose, but just questions uh, to raise, and, and we'll see uh, where some of these questions land uh, if this does indeed move during veto session. So the first concern is the funding source. Um, the bill specifies DCEO as a, as a funding source. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, uh, the uh, Energy Transition Assistant Funds uh, live at DCEO. Uh, that's um, to the tune of uh, about $200 million a year. It's actually a little less, but they, they appropriated $200 million this year. Um, and that happens to be the same amount of money that they're proposing to use for uh, the, this rate relief. Uh, so those of us who are in the siege averse, um, really caught our eye and said, oh, wait, hey, that's a familiar number. Are you, are you looking at our CEGA funds? Um, so we would like to see sort of a clarification of the funding source. The bill talks about it coming out of VCO, but doesn't specify where. Um, we have heard by rumor that it was going to come from leftover funds from the CARE Act, which is the federal COVID relief fund. So um, we think it might be okay, but generally you want things in, in, in writing. Um, we'd also like to see equity improved. Uh, so as written, the bill um, gives relief equally to all residential and small uh, commercial customers in the Ameren territory. Um, we'd like to see uh, that perhaps be targeted. Um, so for example, uh, LIHEAP or PIP customers um, could be the, the target of relief. Um, this wouldn't necessarily need to be 100% of the relief, but um, it seems like a good opportunity to, uh, to try to, to give some relief to low-income customers. Um, so that's another way we could, we'd like to see the bill be um, improved. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, uh, this is, you know, the high cost of electricity is the primary driver of that price increase, um, at least in the Ameren territory. So uh, bringing down that electricity, uh, the, the amount of electricity you use by energy efficiency, recreasing, re re decreasing demand could really, uh, could really help reduce this cost. So um, we, we'd like to see that some of these funds go towards energy efficiency programs um, so that these problems might not exist in the future. Another concern is that, as I noted before, Northern Illinois customers aren't necessarily um, totally uh, free from seeing price increases. Um, there are things that are driving down their price, such as the CJA um, deal on the, uh, the new plants, which is paying HECOMED customers a lot of money. Um, but there are also uh, increases in costs, particularly in the Chicago and in the uh, areas around Chicago. Um, due to uh, natural gas. So um, this could be something that we'd want to see statewide. Um, and then lastly, uh, Ameren's going to be benefiting from this. So Ameren, uh, you know, would, any customer that wouldn't normally be paying their, their 
bill uh, is going to have their bill paid for them by this by this relief. Um, so if Ameren's going to be seeing a benefit, it seems reasonable to um, also have Ameren contribute. Also, given that their lack of investment in energy efficiency programs from the start is contributing to this problem. So um, we'd like to see Ameren through bill assistance or pausing disconnection or investments in energy efficiency, some mean uh, contribute to um, this relief. Um, lastly, I'll just touch on the political context of what's going on. So will it move in veto session? Possibly. Uh, we have veto session coming up 29th, 30th, and December 1st. Um, it isn't off the table or anything. There might be the political will for it. Uh, there are some issues with regional support. So um, if you're in ComEd, why would you want to vote for this bill? Um, and then is you know this five months of relief going to be amended is you know it's right now it seems somewhat symbolic if they don't pass it in veto it's meaningless in lame duck um, because it we were past December 2020. So um, those are some sort of political context of whether or not we'll, we'll see the bill. Um, it's sort of a one where I, I don't know maybe it has some we have some concerns but it's not necessarily the the worst thing that's ever happened by any means. Um, so that's just some context on on Ameren uh, rate relief and I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next, we have Abe Scar, uh, Director for Illinois PERG and Illinois PERG Education Fund, um, presenting on the QIP surcharge, which is ending at the end of 2023. Thank you. Can folks see my screen? Okay. Still loading in on my end. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Samira. My name is Abe Scar. I'm the Director of Illinois PERG. If you're not familiar, we are a citizen-funded public interest advocacy organization. We have a pretty broad agenda, working on a lot of things, but one of our big uh, priorities in recent years that I'm gonna to present to you today is stopping overinvestment by gas utilities in Illinois, specifically ending what's known as the QIP surcharge or rider, um, which we'll get into now. So a little historical background, it's a 2013 law grants People's Gas, NICOR, and Ameren, the three biggest gas utilities in the state, uh, the ability to immediately and automatically tack on charges onto your bill through a bill surcharge. Uh, if you're familiar with the formula rates that ComEd got through their bribery scheme, the surcharge is very similar to that. It operates in a similar way, although it's a little more narrow than what ComEd got. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into the details of how the regulatory process works here. But one of the key things you have to understand about utilities is that uh, they make money by spending money. You know, they uh, invest in their infrastructure. And if regulators deem that appropriate, they're allowed to collect all of that money back, uh, dollar for dollar, plus a profit on top of that. So there already exists with utilities this incentive structure to spend a lot of money and potentially to waste money in order to increase their profits. Um, and there's all types of traditional regulatory checks that try to counterbalance that incentive. And with QIP and with uh, formula rates, essentially what state legislators have done is take away those counterbalances and just made this very powerful incentive for utilities to spend as much money as they can, as fast as they can, often in wasteful ways, uh, in a way that drives up our bills and drives up their profits. And this chart that I'm showing here is I think one of the most powerful representations of this. This shows the authorized profits and actual profits that People's Gas has had over the last decade. So the red line is what regulators have said, you know, this is like the, about the amount of money you should make in profits in a given year. And you can see it's been at right around $100 million for the last 20 years. But the actual amount that they've made, you know, has gone up and down. It's almost, it was never actually reaching that for many years. They even lost money in 2007 until 2017 when the impacts of this rider really took hold. And you can see that not only are they hitting record profits every year, but it's guaranteed, it's locked in. It's not going up and down, it's just going up and up and up. So essentially this is the reward that state policy is giving and, and telling to these utilities, we want you to spend as much money as you can and we're gonna reward you with these record profits. And of course, there's all types of problems with that that I'm going to get into here. So I got into this uh, first by working on the People's Gas Pipe Replacement Program in Chicago. 
I could give a, a, a much longer presentation just on this, and we're not going to do that, but if anyone's interested, we wrote a, a detailed report on it in 2019. Um, essentially, rather than replacing the real risk in their system and dealing with that, which is a subset of pipes that are, are, are at risk of failure, People's Gas is trying to overhaul its entire system. So our critique is that in doing so, it's unaffordable for Chicago residents. They've mismanaged the programs. They're not addressing the real risk in, this, uh, in their system and spending billions on fossil fuel infrastructure as we try to deal with climate change is absurd. Um, that's maps on pretty closely to the critique I'll have more broadly of QIP, which I'll go through here now. So when the bill was passed in 2013, bill sponsor on the floor said that this was gonna cost on average people's gas customers a dollar 14 per month. We just got new data yesterday. In September, the average people's gas customer paid over $15. For this program. So we're paying more per month than legislators thought we'd be paying per year for the program. It's a little different, uh, reflected a little differently in NICOR and Ameren territory right now. It's been translated into big rate hikes. Um, this chart shows NICOR's rates over the last several decades, and you can see for decades, really, they were um, flat. They, they stayed relatively the same, but just in the last four years, they've raised rates uh, three times. 77%, uh, almost doubling. That's not entirely because of QIP, but it's a major contributor. Ameren's not as severe, but 27 rate hikes is nothing to sneeze at. Um, in Chicago, the affordability problem is already really bad and it's getting worse. So this map you can see, this is from October of last year. Um, and you can see how disproportionate uh, impacts are on the South and West sides, that dark red uh, zip code that's in Inglewood, where at this time, over 50% of residents were more than 30, uh, 30 days past on their bill. This other chart you can see, this is um, basically taking the total amount that uh, customers are in debt divided by the total number of customers. And you can just see how bad the, the uh, utility debt problem is in Chicago compared to uh, NICOR and Comet. So the other thing, again, this bill was uh, supposed to be about addressing safety risks in these gas systems. And it is important to acknowledge that there are real risks with using gas. It is inherently unsafe. We put out a report earlier this year that found that there, in the last decade, there has been a major um, methane gas pipeline leak once every 40 hours. And that you know, certainly undercounts the amount of methane that is leaking from our distribution gas systems. Um, they are very leaky. Methane, of course, uh, when burned is a global warming pollutant. And when it just is released in the atmosphere, it's, it's much more potent as a global warming pollutant. We were reminded of this uh, about two months ago when there was an explosion on the west side uh, that was, uh, did, was because of a gas explosion. Um, so while, the pro, while this uh, surcharge was sold as being about dealing with risk in the systems, that's not how the utilities are using the money. So there's been multiple outside reviews of the People's Gas Pipe Replacement Program. This is the most recent in 2020. And one of the top line findings was despite spending uh, billions of dollars on this program, it hasn't coincided with a reduction in pipeline failure rates. So it's just failing at its number one job. In NICOR and Ameren territory, it's a little different story. They've actually already replaced the, the most at-risk pipe, gold cast iron. And um, this is showing uh, leak rates in uh, Ameren. We have a similar chart for NICOR. They're both the same. You can see compared to their peers, they have actually have very low leak rates. They're spending on other stuff that doesn't have to do with safety. Um, there's, there's again, inherent safety problems with any gas system, but there's no like uh, alarm here. There's no justification for this uh, incredible amount of spending that the utilities have been doing. And then the absurdity argument again, uh, you know, climate science tells us that if we wanna uh, avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to stop burning fossil fuels in our homes in the next 30 years. Um, but we're spending billions of dollars on gas infrastructure as if we were going to use it for the next 100 years. And that's gonna cause all different types of problems down the road. And it's also causing problems in the immediate term, just making it harder to make that necessary transition to powering our homes with 100% clean energy. Um, so uh, just a little bit on where we've been with this campaign. I'm not gonna go over all these points, but. Um, we built a coalition of over 43 organizations. Chicago City Council has called for action. Governor Pritzker has been um, uh, vocal in his support since 2020. And uh, Attorney General Raul and Mayor Lightfoot just came out last month uh, calling for the surcharge to end. 
Despite all that, we've made very little legislative progress to date, and that's because of the power of our opposition, not only the three big utility companies, but also the operating engineers 150, which if you pay any attention to Illinois politics, you know, are very politically active and very politically powerful. Um, they've been the ones getting a lot of the work for the People's Gas Pipe Replacement Program, so they're trying to defend that. Uh, but I do think conditions are shifting in our favor. So um, in the past, we've been trying to end the, the law early. Uh, now, going into next year, it's set to end on its own at the end of 2023. So for us to win, nothing needs to happen, and we want nothing to happen. Uh, in order for the utilities to win, they'll need to actually change the law, pass a new law in order to extend it. And so we've got the status quo on our side. Um, Pritzker's support becomes much more important in this scenario. His support wasn't enough to get the legislature to act in the past, but his veto threat is much more powerful. Uh, we are going into high and painful winter gas bills across the state this winter. And I think the Ameren bill that we just heard about is an example of the how these uh, utility bills are more politically salient these days. We've had very low power prices across the country for the last decade because of fracking. That's basically over. Gas prices are high again. And so people are going to be struggling with this and it's going to be more politically risky uh, for utilities, excuse me, for politicians to go out and vote to raise our uh, utility bills and uh, fatten utility uh, shareholder profits uh, when people are struggling. And then we've been talking for years about electrification and the climate case for uh, stopping gas infrastructure spending, but um, it's just starting to happen. So city of Chicago uh, just put out a new climate action plan where they want to electrify 30% of residential buildings in the next 15 years. Uh, there's likely to be a resolution, excuse me, an ordinance soon to end new gas hookups in Chicago for new construction. And so it just makes those arguments more powerful. So our goal is to stop the extension of the QIP law or any lookalike policy that would similarly incentivize gas utility over investment. Um, basically to get that, it's most important that we just keep Pritzker. If we can keep his veto and his veto threat, it's highly unlikely that the Democratic chambers are gonna go to bat so hard to overturn a veto. Um, in order to do that, we need to continue to raise the profile of the issue in the public and with decision makers and just make very clear we're not gonna accept any type of compromise or deal on it. So I'll stop there. Here's my email if folks wanna ask questions and I'll be around later for questions as well. Perfect, thank you, Abe. Um, this goes without saying, but IEC is also focused on defending provisions in CJA as well as other policy work. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A section. And with that, Brian, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Samira. Thanks, Andrew and Abe. Um, we're going to move on to the transportation uh, presentation portion. Um, transportation is the single largest uh, emission, sector of emissions um, in the U.S., and um, IEC has been just leaning more into um, sustainable transportation policy uh, over the last year or so. Um, in addition to leading up our, our federal policy work, I also help um, uh, coordinating Shepard, some of our uh, transportation work um, in a role in which I rely um, extremely heavily <laughs> uh, on the folks that you are about to hear from, um, as well as some of our other uh, uh, partners who are leaders in the space. Um, so um, we wanted to give you a, a, a kind of look into what are IEC's top priorities heading into 2023. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it off with uh, Jose Acosta Cordova, who's the Senior Transportation Policy Analyst for Elvejo, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Um, he's going to be presenting on advanced clean truck rules and the Net Z campaign. Uh, Jose, over to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you to the IEC folks for inviting me to participate tonight. Um, and thank you all for being here as well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about yeah, but like Brian mentioned uh, about the Net Z campaign uh, and some of the work that we're doing on the ground to um, to get some some clean truck and zero emission truck rules passed at the state level. Uh, so who is Net Z? Um, we are uh, the neighbors for an equitable transition to zero emission. Um, we're a group of EJORs, faith based institutions, uh, consumer watchdogs, public health, uh, public health professionals, student activists clean technology businesses, 
and entrepreneurs, and uh, we're all work, working alongside community and civic leaders. And the ultimate goal is about reducing diesel pollution uh, in communities across the state of Illinois. Uh, and I also want to highlight that we uh, we have over 60, 60 organizations that signed a, a letter to the governor uh, that was delivered yesterday. Um, but we have about uh, a couple dozen organizations that are heavily active in this work, some of which you're seeing on the screen. Um, I wasn't able to fit all 60 organizations on the screen, so my apologies to those who, who are left out. Uh, but many of you are on this call right now um, and, and have been a, part, a major part of this work uh, over the last year. Um, so one of the key things that we've been doing recently is the Listen, Lead, Share, which, of course, if you're familiar with uh, this, what, with uh, what was happening during the um, the initial CJA, uh, the initial CJA, the discussions and, and talks across the state, we're doing the same thing for uh, for the, the the Net Z campaign, uh, and also forgot to mention that we also are under ICJC, the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. Um, this is the transportation campaign out of that, um, and what, what we're doing is we're we're hitting different communities across the state uh, to just to to converse with folks to. Uh, let them know about what we're doing to hear folks about what their concerns and issues are related to heavy duty truck traffic in their communities. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to attend one, uh, if you hear about them, there's uh, several happening across the state in the coming months. We've already had a few or a couple, I think, in, one in Pilsen. Uh, and I think I forget the other, where the other location was. Um, but um, but this is a really great opportunity to to converse with us. Let us know what your concerns are. Um, and and uh, and also see how you can get involved with the campaign. So to start right, we got to think about what is diesel pollution, um, and it's the the ground level smog combined with PM two point five, the soot, uh, and that that creates uh, some very toxic pollution that that is plaguing our communities across the state. Um, and this dirty dozen or this this dirty dozen um, report that was done by Respiratory Health Association. Uh, really highlights a lot of the issues that we're dealing with across the state. Um, the, the, these 12 counties uh, actually were all in the top 9% nationwide for, for diesel pollution. Um, so it's pretty alarming. And Cook County and DuPage counties are both in the top 1%, right? So we're talking about some of the most polluted counties in the country. Uh, and then Will, Lake, Kane, Grundy, Kankakee, and Kendall are all within the top 5%. Um, so if you haven't had a chan chance to check out this report, I highly recommend you check it out at the Respiratory Health Association website. Um, and also from the Clean Air Task Force, we got some, some data um, that's looking at projected deaths from diesel in 2023. Um, and you see the number of deaths, number of, of other health issues like heart attacks, different respiratory issues, emergency room visits, asthma exacerbation, um, stuff like that. Right? So this is an issue that we're, we're seeing across the state that's heavily concentrated in the Chicago metro area. Um, but we're not the only part of the state that, that has significant issues with, with diesel pollution. Um, and it's also, it also matters about who's impacted the most, right? And we're, and we're talking about communities of color, Asian, uh, Black, and, and Latino communities that are the most impacted by diesel pollution. Um, and this is why it's, a, this is why it's a, a major issue for our communities. So, so think about what that looks like on the ground. One of the biggest sources of diesel pollution are the intermodal rail yards. These are essentially inland ports. Uh, and we have 19 in the Chicago area, which is by far the most of any part of the, the continent. Um, uh, of those 19, eight are within city limits. Um, and this is an important stat because we have uh, roughly 18 million uh, of the 20, 20 foot or equivalent containers that come through Chicago's, area, Chicago's uh, rail yards every year. Right, so actually this is more containers that then more containers that come through Chicago than actually come into the ports of, Lo of Los Angeles and Long Beach, right? Just, do you get a sense of how many containers are coming through Chicago every year? Um, it is our most direct connection to global trade, right? We, although we're not on a coast, we are in fact a very much a, a port city, uh, and this is how we, this is how it it, uh, it shows up. And what's also important to note is that they're mostly mostly located in the communities of color, right? The map on the left shows Latino communities in the region. Uh, and on the right shows black communities in the region and um and you see the the correlation between where these facilities are located um and where um and where uh, people of color are living and this is what they look like this is core with intermodal this is the third largest uh, intermodal facility in the chicago region uh, but it's the largest within city limits 
uh, I think close to uh, 800 and some thousand containers that come through or 800 some thousand lifts that come through. So it's about double that for the amount of containers. Um, and this is, you see, it's directly located next to communities. You got uh, Bryant Park there on the, the right side, um, uh, Archer Heights on this side, and then little, little villages directly to the north. Um, so, you know, these rail yards, some of them have been there for, for a very long time. Like this one is, uh, was formerly connected to the stockyards where they used to bring the uh, the cattle and the, the hogs from, from the, the central plain states, uh, but was converted into an intermodal rail yard following the closing of the Union stockyards. So some of, some of these ones are, have been here for a long time. Others like uh, um, Center Point out in Joliet area have been constructed more recently. Uh, but nevertheless, again, these are inland ports and we have to treat them as such. Um, and what's also important to note is that around these intermodal ports, you have the concentration of, 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 of other truck intensive facilities, um, particularly stuff with, within the transportation distribution and logistics industry. Uh, and this map shows what that looks like in the Chicago area. I'm sorry, within the Chicago city limits. Um, this is uh, looking at the, how these industrial corridors are zoned, right? In Chicago, we have 26 official industrial corridors, um, the largest of which are all located on the south and west sides or the southeast side of the city. Um, and you see they're, they're zoned as either manufacturing or manufacturing and moving and storing goods. Um, and when you look at uh, this map versus where the intermodals are located, there's a direct correlation between um, between the the uh, the concentration of of transfer of TDL facilities um, and and the uh, location of those intermodals, um, so then that has a major impact on pollution in these communities. Right, the map on the left was was done by NRDC, uh, the cumulative impacts map, and on the right was done by CDPH, Department of Public Health, um, and shows air, there was the air quality and health index. Uh, these maps use uh, similar similar methodology but slightly different, uh, but produce very similar results. Um, so these uh, industrial corridors are, are not only uh, occupied by TDL facilities, um, they are also occupied by other uh, industrial facilities like, like uh, oil and gas facilities, uh, asphalt plants, construction, um, metal shredders, rock crushers, um, industrial packaging, um, as well as, as uh, uh, waste management facilities, right? So there's a lot of, of, of facilities that, that contribute to uh, the significant pollution in these areas. Um, but what's important to note is that all of those facilities have significant truck traffic on a daily basis, right? So these issues that we're talking about, diesel pollution, have a direct impact on our communities, in, not only in Chicago, but across the region. So what are the solutions that we're working on now? So uh, the first one is this, MO, this memorandum of understanding uh, on the medium and heavy duty electrification. Um, it's so far has been signed by 17 states, including the District of Columbia. Um, and it's uh, essentially a commitment to stop selling heav heavily polluting vehicles by 2050. Um, it's important to note that it's not legally binding, um, but it does demonstrate a, a state's intention uh, to protect the, the health of, of, the, of its residents. Um, and in this case, right, the governor has the authority to sign the MOU, uh, and we've already actually passed uh, resolutions through the, uh, the, the House and Senate uh, uh, to, to, uh, to advocate that the governor sign on to this MOU. Um, so shout out to to uh, uh, State Rep Gonzalez and State Senator Villanueva who championed this this uh, this resolution. Um, so this is just the first step. Uh, like I said, it's non-binding, so it's just the first step towards accomplishing the Advanced Clean Truck Rule. Um, this is really a, a really significant rule uh, that originated in California. Um, it is the world's first zero emission commercial truck requirement, um, and essentially what it does is it requires manufacturers uh, to sell or who sell medium heavy duty vehicles. Uh, to sell zero emission vehicles uh, at an increasing percentage of their of their annual sales, um, and because it's an administrative rule, it, it would be uh, under the Illinois Pollution Control Board uh, who would have to adopt it and then implement it by the Illinois EPA. Um, so this is like the the really the first and foremost goal of the Net Z is getting the ACT pass and and joining the other states who uh, who signed on to it. I think there's six states now who signed who who started implementing the ACT. Um, and I think North Carolina just recently, just recently uh, said, announced that they were gonna be pursuing the ACT as well. Um, and I think there were two more other states, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, who are, are working towards it. Uh, but no state in the Midwest has uh, not only signed the MOU, but, but even gotten close to working towards the ACT. Um, so Illinois could be the first to do that. Uh, there's additional rules and policies that we're also pursuing 
Um, the, the NOx omnibus rule is a really important one as well. Um, this requires that the existing diesel trucks that are already out there, um, you, you know, improve the quality of their trucks to make the, their emissions cleaner, um, either by, by uh, you know, by uh, modifying their trucks or by purchasing newer trucks. Um, so this, this one helps uh, the ACT during, during that transition time because it, it removes the dirtiest trucks off of our roads. Um, the other one that's being developed right now is the advanced clean fleet rule. Um, this rule puts pressure on large fleets, um, like some of those that operate federally, um, and, and those that are used at, at the seaport facilities um, to, to adopt clean, uh, clean fleets and zero emission trucks as well. Um, and then there's additional tools that, that, we're looking, that we're working on, uh, both at the state level and the local level. One of the key ones is a port authority, right? When you think about uh, Chicago as a, as a port city, uh, it's very different because we we don't have one single site uh, coastal port the way other ports do uh, on our on our coast right this is you're talking about 19 in, in, um, intermodal rail yards that are operated by six different rail companies um so so uh regulate regulatory uh, regulating those those rail yards becomes very difficult and complicated when you, when you when you start thinking about how we do this um so we're advocating for some sort of port authority or some sort of entity that regulates freight in the chicago region um, and, and that really, you know, we could start thinking about other policies that could go through that, such as the indirect source rule or stuff like that, that would continue, uh, putting, putting more standards on how, on how trucks and, and how companies are allowed to operate. Another one is procurement pro policies and funding. This is a strategy, uh, that includes a, a process of, of rulemaking, uh, and using funding in municipalities, uh, that direct what kind of vehicles are chosen to replace things like police cars and buses and stuff like that. So this is especially important for, for, um, uh, some of the the city owned fleets uh, and then just overall freight electrification mandates um this is uh, again thinking about the um uh, the indirect source rule um and this really making sure that industry and warehouses uh can charge can charge electric vehicles with the right infrastructure requirements as well also uh, thinking about how we fund uh charging infrastructure is really key as well and also connects to the to CJA, um and and some of the money that's being promised there as well as some potential federal money for uh for for charging infrastructure uh, and why do we care about this why are we doing this right we're protecting our most vulnerable community members people who are most vulnerable to, to diesel exposure are elderly people pregnant people uh, young people uh, people with pre-existing health conditions and just overall low income and unhoused people um so that's the ultimate reason why we're doing this work um and we care ultimately because it'll be good for the illinois economy it'll be good for our our overall environmental health um but but also we, we we approach everything with the from the the standpoint of or from the the um uh, the point of view of a just transition right and we, and how do we transition away from fossil fuels matters right and, and that's why we have to think about the workers and the communities there's a lot of truck drivers who are who are going to be uh, uh who are um concerned about what elect, uh, truck electrification means for them especially those who purchased a, a truck recently or who who leased their own trucks um, so thinking about the, the the truck drivers is a crucial part of the work that we're doing. Um, but overall, right, the, the idea of a just transition is critical for how we build a new economy um, that's rooted in, in equity, rooted in democracy, uh, and that ultimately doesn't kill our planet. Um, so the idea is if we put these rules into place, they have the potential to create good new community jobs uh, and creating creating these and, and also, you know, thinking about who's going to build these trucks, right, we have you know, uh, I think uh, two companies here now that are, are opening uh, electric vehicle, medium heavy electric vehicle plants. Um, there's going to be really good, really good paying jobs there for for people. Um, and then ultimately, we want to create benefits for the communities that need them the most, right? So, um, so that's the net Z in a in the show uh, and the work that we're doing. Uh, so, just give you an update on where we're at right now. Uh, we, like I said, we delivered the organizational sign-on letter yesterday with more than 60 orgs uh, signed on. We're planning to deliver two more letters as well, uh, one from health professionals and one from businesses, um, and we'll be doing that in the next month or so. Uh, we also have an in-person press conference plan for December 7th for anybody that wants to uh, to come out and support. Uh, it'll be at 10 a.m. Uh, in Little Village, the location is is to, to be determined, um, but we're aiming for uh, Mi Tierra Restaurant well, which will actually be followed by uh, little uh, El Vejo is hosting a, a resource fair for the community from two to six that afternoon. Uh, so at the very least, if you can't make to the press conference, come out to Little Village, 
uh, for the resource fair and come get a margarita with me um, and we'll be there hanging out uh, all afternoon. Um, we're also going to be we're also working on, a, on an op ed uh, with NRDC that will be re will be released in the coming weeks um, and, and really be highlighting the, the benefits of the ACT in Illinois and also uh, website and social media pages are coming soon. Um, and I just want to put these hashtags in front of you so that you start to get to know them, start to memorize them, start to remember. Um, Stop Diesel Death Illinois, and we just want to breathe. These are two hashtags for the campaign. Um, and if you want to get involved, there's different ways you can do that. You can start community petitions, contact your elected officials, um, just tell a friend. You can also, if you work for an organization that's not currently involved, um, you can join our coalition. Um, there's an email for, for my colleague, Devin Cooley. Um, he's, uh, he's the campaign manager for NetZ. Um, and if you're interested either in just getting some more information, there's his email. Um, and yeah, hope everybody gets involved. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, I'm going to also put a link in the chat. Um, just, Jose was recently interviewed by about the Southwest Industrial Corridor Modernization Plan, and he was talking about Net Z and the goals around the Memorandum of Understanding and advanced clean trucks and the Knox Omnibus rules. Um, so it's a worthwhile read. Um, uh, and I just put that in the chat. So um, thank you, Jose. Um, over to uh, uh, Larissa Kohler, who's the Director of Vehicle Electrification and a Senior Attorney at the Environmental Defense Fund, um, and Aileen Nolan, who's the Director of Global Air, Clean Air uh, for the U.S. Uh, for EDF as well, um, presenting on some legislation we're working on with them focused on insights for health and equity. Um, Larissa and Aileen, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. Is that coming through? It's a, it's kind of small. Yeah. Can you do a slide? There you go. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks very much. Um, all right, this will, I hope, uh, be an excellent um, compliment to what we just heard from Little Village. Um, and so apologies if a little bit of the first slides are a tiny bit repetitive, but really just driving home the importance of um, the, the opportunities that we're talking about here today. Um, one thing to, to pick up on um, and, and repeat is um, we see every, every week, every month, it seems like um, new studies come out to reinforce uh, that unequal exposures are uh, contributing to a disproportionate burden from air pollution. Um, we see even at the same levels of air pollution, black populations have a three times higher uh, risk of dying from that air pollution and a six times higher rate of visiting uh, the asthma emergency room. Um, what is happening, why some of these figures are new is uh, through some really hard work of you know, what, what scientists have already been able to do, what communities have already been able to do, and hopefully through some of the new um, insights that we'll talk about right now, we're able to just pinpoint with more and more clarity where some of these um, unequal burdens are being felt, uh, but there's still, still more to do. Um, so a few more, you know, a few more insights to share is this is really um, a challenge in Illinois. Illinois, as you just heard, has some of the highest rates of um, diesel pollution, uh, premature death, um, asthma, emergency room visits um, of the entire country. Um, what's, what we are able to see with the help of um, some new science and new insights is drawing connections between some things that previously were a little bit more of a guess. So this is based on uh, satellite um, data about uh, nitrogen dioxide in this in the Chicago area, which is now able to conclude that uh, 10,000 kids every year get a new diagnosis of asthma due to nitrogen dioxide, which is primarily medium and heavy duty trucks. Um, and that is not equally felt um, on those um, as we just heard on areas that are around those inland ports and those manufacturing and warehousing corridors, that's an even higher burden of um, truck related pollution causing uh, new, new cases of childhood asthma. And then you know, that kid has 
asthma potentially for the rest of their life, starting them. Um, through also uh, some new work um, that uh, Environmental Defense Fund and partners were able to do um, for the first time is pinpoint the neighbors of uh, warehouses where those trucks are gathering, like we like we just heard when they come out of those inland ports and show up at the warehouses. Um, who lives around those warehouses? Um, it is largely uh, Hispanic and Latino neighbors, largely Black neighbors, uh, and a significant proportion of, of children. And um, as we just talked about, that puts those kids at risk of um, new cases of, of childhood asthma. And so what do we, what do, we do about it? Um, and what's the opportunity um, that we have here today you know, in addition to the um, opportunities to shift the trucks that are on the road now and in the future, which are incredibly, incredibly important, there is a really important need right now to understand the status quo. I think maybe for some folks, not necessarily folks on this call, but others may still really believe that, man, if I can't see you know, if I can't see the smoke coming out of a truck, maybe it's not a problem. Um, there's still, uh, in some places, a bit of a lack of urgency around the, the challenge of, of diesel pollution. And in part, that's because um, there's been a massive underinvestment in monitoring, in air monitoring. So you see here the uh, growth of warehouses around the highways and in communities of color, and then you see these little these little triangle guys are the EPA official monitors, right? So even all those statistics that we just talked about and that Jose talked about about the health consequences are based on um, a really spotty level of monitoring. Some of these monitors are only on one in every six days. You know, it's really, it's really very spotty, and that means that there can be a little bit of a lack of urgency, a little bit of, you know, deniability, right? Um, so that's one thing: is that there's a huge, there's huge blind spots about the the price of the status quo in some cases, and then the second thing why monitoring can be really important is to help land the promises. You know, like let's say if we get the ACT, if we get the Knoxville, if we get, you know, some of the charging rules, um, we need to make sure that those are actually implemented and actually doing what they're promised. And air monitoring can be one part of that picture of making sure that the emissions are actually going down um, in the places where they, where they need to go down. Um, and right now, you know, given what we would be able to learn with, with monitoring, we wouldn't have that accountability quite yet. Um, so why don't I pass it over to Larissa to talk about some of the proposals on the table. Great. Thanks, Aline. Um, so what we're hoping to do, and of course, this is going to be an all hands on deck effort or as many hands as, as possible who can help. But but we um, are working with IEC to put a bill forward um, that it, it's entitled, at least for now, the Health and Equity Insights Bill. Um, that would really help to facilitate a more concrete understanding of inequitable pollution, um, looking at and identifying the sources that cause this pollution, looking at the disparate impacts, the result from this pollution, and uh, really seeking, as Aileen said, to, to make the invisible, what is invisible to a lot of people, visible by deploying additional monitors and integrating satellite data in order to build a robust and community-driven process. Um, that involves analysis, communication, investment, and enforcement. Um, so what does that mean more specifically? So as I alluded to, it would require better expanded monitoring, and this includes things like continuous monitoring at truck attracting facilities, such as warehouses and distribution centers, looking at facilities like power plants that are identified as significant emitters um, in order to mitigate that current problem of hotspots too often being ignored. Um, if you look at the previous slide, in that large area where there's obviously a, a lot of warehouses, there's one monitor and it doesn't necessarily reflect um, you know, where the pollution is probably gonna be heaviest because there are so many warehouses. Um, and then rather, 
then allow this monitoring to just exist, we also need to pair that with looking at the data and analyzing it in a continuous way to ensure that the worst polluters are um, actively being monitored um, and that something is being done about them and that that inf information is going to the same overburdened communities um, that are living the experience of pollution on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we would identify uh, the pollution burden, burden communities, expand monitoring, and then use that data on an ongoing basis to establish policy solutions that appropriately center equity and prioritize pollution burden communities, while also requiring the department that's carrying out this monitoring and data analysis is providing a front seat role to pollution burden communities um, to shape those policy solutions and continue to help implement them. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'll end by, by just um, highlighting a few transportation policies that could potentially be informed by this heightened analysis and monitoring um, and community involvement. This is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but we can see how some of these uh, policy solutions could be helped um, by more information so that they can appropriately prioritize addressing the need to see positive impacts in these communities. Uh, the indirect source rule, which focuses emissions reductions on truck attracting facilities. Um, this is something Jose brought up. Um, so these truck attracting facilities would be required to take certain measures, such as buying zero emission vehicles or installing charging stations or pay mitigation fees that can then be used for key measures to reduce emissions. And of course, if you know where these warehouses are and where the worst offenders are, we can prioritize making sure that we're addressing those warehouses first and foremost. Rebate programs and financing um, can be structured with more information to prioritize pollution burden communities um, and make sure that low income individuals are able to benefit from these rebate programs. Um, zoning can be aided by helping to better ensure that permitting and siting facilitate deployment of charging stations and by extension vehicles in impacted communities. Um, implementation of federal programs like the Clean School Bus Program, um, tax credits, uh, clean vehicle grant programs um, that have to abide by Justice 40 requirements could potentially be um, bolstered and made more effective um, by better information. Utility programs that deploy infrastructure uh, will be able to more easily prioritize pollution burden communities. And of course, uh, very critically important is education outreach. So making sure that we're able to target education outreach to the most pollution burden communities by um, identifying them and also providing better information. So I'll stop there and then I think um, turn it back over to Brian to, for the next presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Larissa and Aileen. We're really excited to work with EDF on uh, on this important bill. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Audrey Wenink, who's the Director of Transportation at the Metropolitan Planning Council, um, who's gonna talk about um, pedestrian and bike safety and the Safe Streets Initiative. And I think it's a particularly just interesting conversation about you know um, the intersection and similar priorities for environmental groups um, and uh, you know pedestrian safety um, kind of converging in one place. So, um, Audrey, over to you. All right, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am, a, as Brian said, I'm the Director of Transportation with the Metropolitan Planning Council, and we are a nonprofit uh, research policy and advocacy organization working on urban planning issues in the region uh, and trying to improve the equity and sustainability of, of our region. So I'm gonna focus on um, some, you know, largely biking and walking issues, although there, there are a number of uh, related issues uh, that intersect as well. Um, to start out, I'm going to, oops, let me just, okay. Okay, um, I just wanna show a few pictures of some international locations to inspire everyone and to help people start to think about what's possible about um, our transportation system uh, and making zero emissions modes of transportation, biking and walking. 
um, more feasible. And I, I want to share, um, you know, in particular uh, countries that are not as wealthy as the United States are making this happen and have made it happen in particular during uh, COVID, where a lot of uh, global cities really prioritize biking and walking and, and put in place uh, temporary facilities that they're now making permanent. Um, Mexico City, uh, you may be surprised to hear they are on track to have 600 kilometers of protected bike lanes by 2024. They're really making this a priority. This is a photo from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, this city is one of the top five most bike friendly cities in the whole world. Um, and they're, uh, they have 500 kilometers of bike lanes right now, uh, protected bike lanes, and, and are adding another 300. Um, and, and they have really, uh, you know, prioritized this from an equity perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, people are really using these facilities. Um, this is a picture from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, they have undertaken a whole effort to prioritize people. Um, through a super blocks concept. Um, you, can, you can probably see from this photo, uh, some of the street has been repurposed. Um, and uh, this is a, an area that now has um, been transformed into places for people. Uh, they're they're uh, reducing the amount of asphalt for cars and um, prioritizing biking and walking. They're doing lots of great things around their schools to, make, uh, to incentivize biking and walking and make it even safer for people. Uh, and so the point here is that, um, you know, we have that same opportunity and the same urgency to reorient our transportation investments to focus um, on prioritizing climate safety and equity uh, and making communities uh, more navigable by biking and walking. Because the reality is that a lot of the trips that people take around their communities are, are less than uh, five miles long, a lot, a lot are less than three miles. And um, these are distances that could easily be transferred to different modes of transportation that are um, zero emissions the next day. <laughs> you know, if you, uh, even better than an electric vehicle uh, right now. Um, so we really need to make these, um, these options attractive, um, but we do have some, some challenges. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, Greenhouse gases uh, in our region are nearly one third of the total emissions um, from uh, the different sectors. This is a recent data that was calculated by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. This is actually 2019 pre, pre COVID data, um, and it might be actually worse right now because um, we have seen uh, a lot of. Uh, driving has resurged in our post-COVID environment. Um, but I also want to show the absolute tragic statistics uh, in terms of traffic fatalities that are, are going on right now, uh, you know, with, with more people driving, driving more recklessly. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe how bad this graphic is. So the blue line is the annual fatalities. You're showing how many people um, have been dying. I mean, this is only in our region too. This is, you know, the numbers are double when you look at the state of Illinois. Uh, the green line is a five-year average. The red line is the target. Our state set safety targets just based on, uh, frankly, wishful thinking. You know, setting, oh, we, we hope to see a 2% reduction. So they just uh, publish the number and they're, they're, we're not doing enough to change the environment so that we actually see different results. I, I also want to um, point out, uh, as I was mentioning, the amount of driving that's been going on, the green bar is the total vehicle miles traveled. Um, and so that's the, the metric we look at a lot in transportation in terms of uh, people's behavior. Um, this is why greenhouse gases have been going up for transportation in no other sector. It's because driving is going up twice the rate of population growth. Um, that has a lot, to, a lot to do with, um, you know, the way we're developing, sprawl, uh, and that we're not creating attractive and safe and plentiful connected networks for biking and walking. And it's just not attractive enough, and it doesn't feel safe enough for people to use. And so they're uh, they're driving. Um, I'll also note uh, the blue line, which is transit ridership. So as I noted, this data is from 2019. Uh, it's pretty scary to see how much this 
the transit ridership was going down even between 2015 and 2019. So this is pre-COVID. If we had this graphic going to the present day, it would be way off the chart. Uh, that blue line transit ridership is down even further, which means all those trips are getting shifted probably to more unsustainable modes of transportation. So we have a lot of work to do to shift people back to more sustainable modes and even um, you know, improve over where we were pre-COVID. Um, and this graphic, uh, things got a little flipped here, but this graphic in terms of um, safety, I also wanna highlight um, what the, uh, the safety profile is for pedestrians and bicyclists specifically. So we have terrible, terrible trends overall, and we have terrible trends for biking and walking. Um, you know, last year we had a 31 increase in um, bicycle and pedestrian deaths over the previous year. And it's, it's not looking better this year. Uh, so this, is a, this means that you know, it creates more of an incentive for people not to bike and walk if they don't feel safe and they feel like they're risking their lives. Um, so we have absolutely have to create safe infrastructure for people so that this is an attractive mode of transportation, healthy, uh, non-emissions. We just talked a lot about emissions and pollution, um, zero emissions, uh, essentially free other than maybe maintaining your bike, you know, uh, but once you have a bike, getting around is free. Um, and so it's really important that these transportation modes be um, made safer and more attractive. I also want to highlight just accessibility. I think this is something that we do not think about enough at all in our society. There are a ton of people that don't drive in society. Um, you know, think about the, the human lifespan where people don't drive until they're 16 or 18. Um, certainly so children, teenagers, they don't, they don't have independence if they are required to have their parents drive them around. Um, and then people as they age, um, most people lose their license at the end of their life. And then many people are diagnosed with some type of um, uh, medical condition or disability or have that, you know, that their whole life where they can't drive. So we need to be de designing a transportation system that everyone can use. Whenever we're spending money on, on roads that serve only cars, there's a lot of people that are not benefiting from those investments. And, um, you know, of course, those have, you know, ter terrible uh, climate and safety impacts. Um, so we need to be designing for people of all ages and abilities. And this really makes communities uh, much more economically competitive. You know, the pictures that I showed at the beginning, I think all of us want to live in places like that. Those are, these are human-centered communities uh, or places that there's not a lot of noise, there's not a lot of emissions. Kids can play more freely. Uh, parents uh, don't have to be terrified their kid's going to be run over by a car. Um, and, and those are pleasant environments for people to live in, and we need to move in that direction. Um, and then I think this is the last of my data slides, uh, just to reinforce that we need to uh, provide other options um, for all the people that don't drive. Uh, you know, you may not know that over a quarter of households in Chicago have zero vehicles. So already more than a quarter of households, you know, no one's ever driving. Um, and then uh, even, even in the suburbs, there's a significant number of households that do not have a car. So 13% region-wide. So this is something that needs to be addressed, uh, you know, not only in the city of Chicago, um, you know, honestly, but everywhere, even in rural areas uh, that may think that biking, walking is not relevant to them. And when we're doing work on the state level, uh, for when you go to Springfield, right, you know, and you're walking around our, our small and mid-sized cities, uh, people need to walk, be able to walk safely there too. Um, small downtowns, making them competitive and vibrant. Um, and so this is just really, really important. So how do we fix this? How do we, you know, how do we um, make things better? We really need to prioritize implementation of complete streets. So on, on the left is, is a treatment that's um, been done in Chicago recently during COVID. This is about, about the only thing um, the city did that was kind of proactive action during COVID was um, some, of, some of these quick implementation projects, which you can call kind of paint and post. You see some bollards there. You also see, see some bollards that were knocked over by cars, um, but basically cleaning more space for pedestrians, make, creating shorter distances uh, for crossing where cars 
where, where people are exposed to auto traffic, you can see that asphalt is now much, much narrower. Um, this can be a step towards permanent implementation. So I think the city is planning in many cases, if you've seen this kind of treatment in downtown Chicago, to turn these into permanent concrete installations. So, um, you know, that's, that's the way you need to do it. Um, this is a, a, a treatment in, in Niles where they have a, a fully protected, concrete protected bike lane. Um, this is a uh, North Shore uh, bike trail where they now have um, you know, sensors uh, for bikes and lights go on when bikes are crossing this road in this very, um, very bright crosswalk and you see that it's ADA accessible, there's ramps. So these kinds of installations are possible and, and should be happening everywhere and uh, should be, we should be prioritizing them um, in, as we make our investments. We need to be creating complete networks. So all too often we have gaps in our networks. Uh, and so people can only go part way uh, of where they wanna go or part of the, the route is very scary and dangerous and, and parts good. So they don't make the trip at all. Um, this is one success story in, in, uh, in Aurora on the left side where, um, if you are out in this area, definitely check out this absolutely gorgeous bridge. Uh, it connects the Aurora Metra Center, you know, on the other side of the river in this picture, um, to the Fox River Trail. Um, it's bike and ped only. Um, but we, you know, we rarely see this kind of beautiful, dignified uh, in infrastructure for, for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, but this, this is creating a major connection between two facilities. And on the right side uh, is a, a shared street in Batavia. Um, Batavia is like one of the best suburbs for um, make, you know, making, prioritizing biking and walking. Um, and so this is possible you know, in many, many communities. And we just need to, we need to have um, the data and then we need to uh, just develop the projects and fund them. Here's another just, just example of the kind of infrastructure we have now uh, that we, we just have to stop doing this and we have to retrofit it. I mean, people can't get on this bus because why? Because there's no sidewalk there. So only people who can walk in the grass can get to this bus. Um, nobody with a disability or mobility device and probably no one's gonna go to this bus anyway because it looks like you're not supposed to get there. And so just like opening our eyes to all the weaknesses of the system we have now that I think we've gotten used to just not noticing, but we need to really be paying attention and, um, and pressuring municipalities, counties um, and the state to be investing much more and um, completing these networks and, and uh, making a complete system for people. I wanna talk uh, also about, you know, how do we help um, help with the safety and help get these numbers down in terms of um, pedestrians and bicyclists being killed. Um, a large part of this is reducing vehicle operating speeds. So um, it's, it's just really, really compelling when you see this data um, that if a car is going 20 miles an hour, you're almost definitely, and you get hit, you're almost definitely gonna make it. If it's twice that, the majority, the vast majority of people are going to die if they're hit by a car. Uh, and we, there's a lot of places in this region where you have arterials that are two and three lanes in each direction that people are going 40 and 50 miles an hour. And then there's a crosswalk and it's like terrifying. Um, so we need to be, uh, doing road diets, we need to be narrowing travel lanes, we need to be designing streets uh, so that we give cues to drivers so they reduce their speeds. Uh, you know, uh, we need to elevate the pedestrian experience like putting in um, medians and um, pedestrian refuge islands. Um, so the, you know, the, the long-term future is that every time we touch a roadway, we need to think about how we can design it so cars will get signals to go slower and not make everything look like a highway. Because no matter what, um, you know, even if you change the speed limit, the design is really, really important. So I'll just um, end with, you know, what do, what do we do about this? Um, we, you've probably all heard about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, which was uh, which is now being implemented, and we have five years of increased funding. Um, a large chunk of that is formula funding that comes to the state of Illinois, the Illinois Department of Transportation, and the the DOT gets to to determine how to spend it. Uh, and so we need to 
influence the Illinois Department of Transportation to prioritize walking, biking, and transit. And, and um, we are you know, trying to do that through various methods, through uh, trying to influence internal processes that IDOT has. Uh, and, and then also um, you know, looking at what can't be influenced by that uh, because the Illinois Department of Transportation is a large, extremely large agency that you know, we, we, uh, we compare to a cruise ship. Uh, it's really hard to turn it, really hard to change things. Um, so there are also uh, definitely things we need to do legislatively. Uh, we've been exploring a, you know, a menu of items uh, that we've been looking at. And so I just, I'm just mentioning a couple that I think are a high likelihood that we might want to take on um, next year. We just had a, a long meeting with some IDOT staff yesterday to try to figure out um, what, you know, what needs to be handled legislatively. Um, well, I was talking about needing to design roadways to reduce speeds. Um, one thing that is true in Illinois is that our current default speed limit in the state of Illinois, so it's like if there's no speed limit sign on the side of the road, uh, you know, and, and this is largely in, you know, kind of urban environments or uh, maybe neighborhoods, the default speed limit right now is 30 miles an hour. Um, and that's still a really dangerous speed limit for pedestrians and bicyclists. So there's a lot of interest in changing the default speed limit uh, down five miles per hour. That's been done in about half the states in the country. Um, we have seen uh, improved results uh, in terms of uh, cars at the high end of speeds slowing down. Um, and uh, it's just it's just a you know a step to take. And this would allow then. So this would be an enabling legislation, and then this would allow every municipality Illinois, in Illinois to then pass their own ordinance to change um, to change uh, their uh, local speed limits. Um, and then the second bullet, which is sort of may seem like a niche thing, um, but we've actually learned, or the third bullet uh, about um, designing for heavy trucks. So we, we talked a lot about heavy trucks. Heavy trucks are all over the place. Um, but uh, a few years ago, the state of Illinois uh, established a requirement that every single intersection in the entire state of, of Illinois had to be designed to handle heavy trucks. We do have a lot of freight in our, in our, in our state, this is true, but what this does is when you design an intersection for heavy trucks, it means you have a very shallow turn radius, a, lot, like a, lot, a wide turn radius, and cars just careen around the curb. Um, so it really it, it enables and, and it gives a signal for high speeds and high speed turns at intersections. So that's where you run into to pedestrians. Um, and so we probably need to try to undo this, um, this, this legislation from about five years ago um, and, and not make it mandatory and require more review of context um, because otherwise we're gonna be making our intersections all worse. <laughs> so these are just a couple of examples of the kinds of kinds of things that um, are in our statutes now that we need to um, need to change. Uh, and, um, you know, we're looking at packaging, um, you know, packaging a few things and, and trying to get um, some legislative changes that will benefit pedestrians and, and uh, bicyclists. And, and, you know, we've had a very tragic year in Chicago, probably many of you know, there have been a number of children killed in the city of Chicago. So, um, which is, there's nothing good about that. But I will say that um, legislators have have started to pay attention and have started to reach out and ask, what do we need to do? So this may be, we may be at a, at a, at a place where there's an opportunity next legislative session to, to pass some things where sadly in the past, there's people have been very passive um, about these issues. Um, so hopefully we can, uh, we can get some changes uh, next year. So I will, um, Stop there, just let you see my contact information, and I think we're going to have a little Q&A. All right. Thank you, Audrey. Um, we're going to move into q and I'm just going to um, share a quick slide. Um, first, just thank you to our presenters um, who are all still on to answer any questions uh, folks may have. Um, for uh, Q&A, um, if you can use the raise hand function um, on Zoom just to get in a queue so we can um, do a first come first serve on uh, on questions. And I realize this uh, part of the slide is silly. Um, if you are dialing in via phone, 
Um, you could hit star nine to raise and lower your hand and star six to mute and unmute yourself, um, which you obviously can't see if you are dialing in on phone. Um, so use the raise hand, use uh, star nine. Um, and yeah, we would uh, love any questions um, folks have. Um, I can just start while while folks are are raising hands. Um, Audrey, you mentioned that just driving has been increasing significantly and and um, transit ridership has decreased significantly over the last decade. Um, do you mind just digging in a little on like what do you think the main reasons are? Is this a lot of, you, you mentioned um, the trend has just been exacerbated during COVID. Um, so like what can we, what can we do, particularly coming out of the COVID, um, you know, uh, exclamation on this um, to help? Yeah, well, and I, I could do a whole other presentation on transit. I mean, I think one thing, um, so I think it's, it has a lot to do with land use, I mean, how many people and, are living near transit and how many jobs and destinations are near transit. And we have been actually reducing densities in the city of Chicago by like, converting multi-unit or, or converting three flats or knocking down three flats and make buildings singing single family homes you know um in a lot of places in the city um which which adds up uh people have been working from home even before the covid um pandemic um which reduces a, a lot of transit trips for work commute trips and so you know we're going to have to re-envision our transit system to be one that serves uh doesn't focus only on commute trips but that focuses on um, focuses on all trips, so people can be using transit, you know, for for many more purposes, and not only just the commute. And um, we also need to. I think everyone that if anyone that lives in Chicago has been um, seeing that the the rider experience needs to be improved. Um, and so we we just we need to make it. We need to make transit. Transit has, has been underfunded. Um, but we need to make it competitive, you know, and attractive. And um, I know CTA is working on that. Uh, we all, you know, we all need to try not to like pile on and malign transit, but you know, try to turn it around and 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 show people that it's a, it's it's a huge climate solution. It's an equity solution. Um, it's a public health solution, and we need to support it. Um, and I'll also just preview. Unfortunately, uh, we've had COVID relief dollars for the past two, three years from the federal government to keep transit running during COVID, those operating dollars are gonna run out in two years. So there's gonna be a financial cliff in terms of operations. Um, so just file that away in your head and um, transportation advocates like us and Active Trans are going to be needing to work on that and, and figure out new solutions to fund transit so it doesn't even get more contract, you know, contracted and um, have, have fewer riders. We need to be expanding it and have more riders. Thank you. A um, couple plugs. Um, one, uh, Brian Arbacheski put a Netsy action alert in the chat as well. I just want to make sure folks folks see that. Um, and um, Larissa, did you um, did you want to clarify? Um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. And um, this was this is always this is obvious in my head, and it may not have translated to what I, I actually said. But I just wanted to make it clear that the transportation policies that I listed are obviously complementary to the critically important actions that Jose described as being part of the Net Z um, uh, advocacy campaign. So, all right, thank you. Um, question from Stephen. Stephen, I think you uh, need to unmute. There we go. There I was go. on mute. Gotcha. Um, I'm Stephen Sondheim. I've been very involved in the, in transportation and a lot of other issues with the Sierra Club in, in Tennessee, in California, and now here. Oh, my God, this has been wonderful. So many of these issues that you all have raised, and I've asked a number of questions. I've pointed out a number of things in the chat. Um, ah, what's the most? There's so many good ways to work on this. For example, all this distribution and these warehouses we've got, it's a multi, it's a multi kind of problem. The fact that we have warehouses, the, the fact that we have so many, the fact of where they're placed, the fact that we're doing so much long distance distribution and um, 
the fact that we're using diesel trucks or that we're not taking advantage of rail freight, at least as at least for the major part of it, all that needs to be worked on. And I have to tell you that I was on a hearing with the trucking agency and other people, and one of their valid and, and most important objections was it cost a lot of money for them not only to get new kinds of trucks, but to handle their whole distribution up and down the line with that and to comply to these regulations. And my answer to them was that's the very reason why over time they could shift to electric because there wouldn't be as many regulations for them. There wouldn't be any as many labor requirements to do all this extra work. And so I really think that these new industries that are more efficient, that eventually are less costly over time, uh, really ha are really the way to go. Um, and I'm really glad that the transportation person showed some of the, particularly Colombia and Mexico City, I've been paying attention. They're totally revamping their, their cities in terms of really, really mm -hmm. safe ways to get around. And it takes time, it's changing the infrastructure. You know, I live in Chicago. I mostly bike and walk. I do drive. My, my wife was hit in a crosswalk, somewhat crippled. Um, it's getting nuts in Chicago to drive. I even, I joke with people, I say it's dangerous to drive. And what I mean by that is there's so many um, places where you could hit somebody or, or the scooters, the, the bikes weaving in and out, the pedestrians, the crosswalks. It's getting, it's just getting really dangerous here. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I think lowering the speeds would help a lot. I worked with a transportation engineer nationally known Walter Kulash, who showed that you can get more traffic through something at a slower speed. And that, um, well, I lived in San Francisco where they had timed lights for about eight different streets, both east and west and north and south. And the time lights, it doesn't do any good to travel at 40 because you just have to stop at a light. So you travel at 25 and you can get completely across the city. So there, there's just lots of improvements that can be made. Um, if anybody wants to comment, fine. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, and appreciate your, your comments in the chat and your enthusiasm um, on the issues. I'm, I'm also guessing it's not the first time Audrey has been called the transportation person um in her uh in her her career um any other questions from folks on these or other transportation issues um i i have one more um well we've still got you um i think most folks here kind of like walk through um what are some actions to be taken and um some ways to get involved abe i just i wanted to um kick it back to you though, um, to lay out any, like what are some next steps people can take and, and ways to get involved in, in your campaign. And um, if your adorable child is still on the screen, that's, that's a plus. We may have lost Abe, um, so I will. Oh, I'm there sorry, I was slightly distracted by my time. What was the question again? I'm sorry. Um, just how, how do folks get involved and, and kind of what can people do? Um, what kind of actions can, can yeah. folks take to, on, 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 the, um, on your issues? Well, if anybody, anybody from organizations are welcome to uh, endorse the campaign, if I have a hand in a second, I can paste the link. They're moved because they're looking at us, sweetie. Um, and um, we, we'll have action alerts uh, up on our website. The folks can take immediate action uh, as individuals, not necessarily organizations. And um, I anticipate, I hope with our coalition that more groups will create opportunities for individual action as well. And if anybody's interested, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me again at abidillinoisperv.org. Wonderful. All right, folks, we've, we've hit our 730 mark. Um, so I'm gonna just flash one more um, slide up on the screen just to um, thank our presenters again um, on, on, on all of their presentations, super informative, 
really wonderful um, uh, ways to get involved. Um, if you've got any questions, if it's helpful to get connected to any of our presenters and you didn't um, write down their uh, 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 information quick enough, um, you can reach out to uh, myself or Samira. Um, uh, our emails are, are in the slide right there, Samira at ilenviro.org or Brian at ilenviro.org. Um, and we really appreciate everyone's time and really appreciate you coming out. We hope um, you'll get more involved in IEC and, and get more involved in energy and transportation issues. Uh, thanks so much. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks all.